ಅರ್ಥಾಯ ಪ್ರತಿಬೋಧಿ ಭಗವತ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಸ್ವಯಂ ವ್ಯಾಸೇನಾಗ್ರಥಿ ಪುರಾಣ ಮುನಿ ಮಧ್ಯೆ ಮಹಾಭಾರತ ಅದ್ವೈತಾಮೃತವರ್ಷಿ ಭಗವತಿ ಅಷ್ಟಾಧ್ಯಾಯ ಅಂಬಾತ್ವಾಮನುಸಂದಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತೆ ಭವದ್ವೇಷಿ ನಮೋಸ್ತು ವ್ಯಾಸ ವಿಶಾಲ ಬುದ್ಧೆ ಫುಲ್ಲಾರವಿಂದಯ ತಪತ್ರ ನೇತ್ರ ಯೇನಾತ್ವಯ ಭಾರತ ತೈಲ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಪ್ರಜ್ವಲಿತ ಜ್ಞಾನಮಯ ಪ್ರದೀಪ ಪ್ರಪನ್ನ ಪಾರಿಜಾತ ಯಾತ್ರ ವೇತ್ರೈಕ ಪಾನೇ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಮುದ್ರಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯ ಗೀತಾಮೃತದುಹೆ ನಮಃ ಸರ್ವೋಪನಿಷದು ಗೋ ದುಗ್ಧ ಗೋಪಾಲನಂದನ ಪಾರ್ಥೋ ವತ್ಸ ಸುಧೀರ್ಭೋಕ್ತ ದುಗ್ಧಂ ಗೀತಾಮೃತ ಮಹತ್ ವಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚ್ಚಾನೂರ ಮಾರ್ದನ ದೇವಕಿ ಪರಮಾನಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಭೀಷ್ಮ್ರೋಣ ತಟ ಜಯತ್ರತ ಜಲ ಗಂಧಾರ ನೀಲೋತ್ಪಲ ಶಾಲ್ಯಾಗ್ರಹವತಿ ಕೃತೇನ ವಹನಿ ಕರ್ಣೇನ ವೇಲಾಕುಲ ಅಶ್ವತ್ಥಾಮ ವಿಕರ್ಣ ಘೋರ ಮಕರ ದುರ್ಯೋಧನ ವರ್ತಿ ಸೋತೀರ್ಣ ಖಲು ಪಂದವೈರನ ನದಿ ಕೈವರ್ತಕ ಕೇಶವ ಪರಾಶಾರ್ಯವಚ ಸರೋಜ ಮಮಲಂ ಗೀತಾರ್ಥಗಂಧೋತ್ಕಟ ನಾನಾಖ್ಯಾನಕ ಕೇಸರ ಹರಿಕಥ ಸಂಬೋಧನ ಬೋಧಿ ಲೋಕೆ ಸಜ್ಜನ ಶತ್ಪದೈರ ಹರ ಪೇಪೀಯಮಾನಾಮುಡ ಭೂಯದ್ ಭಾರತ ಪಂಕಜ ಕಲಿಮಲ ಪ್ರಧ್ವಂಸಿ ನಾಶ್ರೇಯಸೆ ಮೂಕಂ ಕರೋತಿ ವಲ ಪಂಗುಂ ಲಂಘಯತೆ ಗಿರಿ ಯತ್ಕೃಪತಮಹಂ ವಂದೇ ಪರಮಾನಂದ ಮಾಧವ ಯಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮವರುಣೇಂದ್ರ ರುದ್ರ ಮರುತಸ್ತುನ್ ವಂತಿ ದಿವ್ಯಸ್ತವೈ ವೇದೈ ಸಂಗ ಪದ ಕ್ರಮೋಪನಿಷದೈರ್ಗಾಯಂತಿ ಯಂ ಸಮಗ ಧ್ಯಾನವಸ್ತಿ ತದ್ಗತೇನ ಮನಸ ಪಶ್ಯಂತಿ ಯಂ ಯೋಗಿನೋ ಯಸ್ಯಂತ ನ ವಿದುಸ್ಸುರಸುರಗನಾ ದೇವಾಯ ತಸ್ಮೈ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀ ಸತ್ಗುರು ಮಹಾರಾಜ ಕೀ ಜೈ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಗುಡ್ ಟು ಸಿ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಯು ಅ ಲಾಟ್ ಆಲ್ ವೀಕ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಸೊ ನೈಸ್ ಟು ಸಿ ಯು ಹೂವರ್ ಈಸ್ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಶೋ ಅಪ್ ಇನ್ ಕಮ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ Today is a big day. We are starting a new chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. You can imagine, I think, I think, I don't know exactly when we started with the Gita, but it's probably was about three, a little more than three years ago. I started with uh, Kalyani and Pablo. And yeah, in three years, only 11 chapters we covered. So it is always a big deal, you know, to... Uh, we have the Juan Jose, he was the, the fourth student, the fourth one. He, was, he joined next, right? It was three years ago, I think. Anyway, um, today we are starting chapter 12, which is, every chapter is very special, but chapter 12 is a particularly very special chapter in the Bhagavad Gita. It is called Bhakti Yoga, it, uh, and it is dealing with the yoga of devotion. and I want to do a kind of an introduction to the subject. Uh, but before that, in the last class, I mentioned that we finished a part of the Gita. There is a very uh, important uh, yogi uh, commentator, Acharya, whose name was Madhusudana Saraswati. 
He was a teacher of Advaita Vedanta and he wrote a very important commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. And he was the first one to divide the Bhagavad Gita, which consists of 18 chapters into three parts, each consisting of six chapters. So chapter one to six is the part which is called Karma Yoga. It doesn't mean that it is the only topic because Krishna is talking about everything in these chapters, but the main topic in this, the, the main subject or the focus you can say is on Karma Yoga, the yoga of service, okay? Then, um, then the second part, um, Actually, we didn't, now I realize, we didn't finish that part, but we are entering into the last, last part of the second. This is chapters 7 to 12, including chapter 12, is the middle part, which is dealing with bhakti, bhakti yoga. And now we are really getting into the essence of bhakti, but we can see the Vishvarupa Darshana in chapter 11, and we can see when uh, Krishna is telling Arjuna about all the different types of meditations, this is all talking about devotion, about devotion. And now we are getting into the heart of it in chapter 12. And then the last part, it is chapters 13 to 18 to the last is Jnana Yoga. Is dealing with the subject of Jnana Yoga. So now uh, we are entering into the last chapter of the part which is dealing with Bhakti Yoga. And that's the importance of this. It is, uh, it's kind of the grand finale of the topic of Bhakti Yoga, and it is also called Bhakti Yoga. So I wanted to do a little introduction to uh, this topic, okay? Swami Shivananda says that Bhakti Yoga is the easiest path in the Kali Yuga. In our age, Bhakti Yoga is the easiest path. But I find that often people are confusing emotionalism with Bhakti. You know, uh, usually people who are very uh, strong character, there will be yogis, Raja yogis. People who are very active, they will be karma yogis. People who are very rational, philosophical, they will go into jnana yoga. And then what is left is people who are very emotional. They are called bhaktas. But actually, as we are going to see also later, uh, bhakti yoga is not about emotionalism. Um, bhakti yoga is about harnessing the emotional aspect of our being into our spiritual quest, okay? Because of the understanding of the importance of emotions. Often people have the feeling that in, in yoga, emotions seem as a problem. So if you, do, if you are not very emotional, if you don't experience so much emotions, that is better in yoga because uh, your mind is not tossed away by the emotions, which has its own reason, but actually yogis give a lot of importance to emotions. We have to understand what emotion is doing, what is the role of emotion, and then we will understand bhakti yoga, I think in a whole different way. And the idea is, and probably also some of you have heard me talking about it many times, is that emotions are the mobilizing force of our thoughts. Emotions are the mobilizing force of our thoughts. What is the idea? The idea is that what is giving strength, what is giving power to our thoughts and therefore to our actions also, is the emotion and the attention that is associated with these thoughts. And I will give you example, uh, which I always give. Okay, now we are in a Zoom, so it's not very practical, but when I sit with groups, I ask them, 
So what did you eat last Monday for lunch, right? And then maybe somebody remembers something, but, but usually we don't remember what we ate for lunch last Monday. We don't remember because it's not very important thing, right? But then I ask who remembers what was the menu on your wedding day? And then many times I have some older ladies in the, in the audience, uh, she shyly re re raised her hand and I asked, so how long ago did you marry? She says, 40 years ago. Really, and you remember what was the menu on your wedding day? Oh yeah, I remember everything. Now, how is it that you don't remember what you ate, what was the menu last Monday, but you remember what was the menu 40 years ago? Because it is a menu. Evidently, from the point of view of, of, uh, of an object, it is the same. Okay? It is a menu and it is a menu, but there is a very big difference because on her wedding day, her whole being and all her emotional being was focused on that. It was such a big deal. She was preparing so much. She was thinking about it so much. It was so important for her that it will be so good that everybody will appreciate. And, and you, you, you understand the point, right? It was full of emotion and attention. And therefore, even 40 years ago, she's able to remember the menu. On the other hand, last Monday, it was nothing special. Every day she has to eat lunch. It is, there's nothing important about it. And therefore she doesn't give it attention and emotion, right? In this way, we can start to understand that emotions play a very important role in our sadhana. You know, uh, two people are practicing meditation. They sit for one hour, okay? You look, you stand behind them and you look at them, it looks just the same, right? Both of them sit straight with the back straight, closed eyes, wonderful. One of them is so bored and so tired and just is there doing it every day for the past 10 years. So it's just doing it, you know? It's something to be done, to tick, you know, uh, done, over over with, right? Did it happen to you? It happens, right? We do it, it happens. We practice for so many years, like, but that's it. The, the, there is no emotion associated with it. There is no much coming into it. The other person, on the other hand, that person is fully inspired. I don't know how, but that person is completely excited about this meditation. Just cannot have enough of it. Do you think that both of them are going to be affected in the same way by the practice? Of course not, right? When you do something with a lot of emotion and with attention, that creates a very powerful, strong samskara because emotions are the mobilizing force of our thoughts. That's the idea. It creates a very strong samskara. Okay, now what is samskara in a nutshell for those of you who did not hear about it? Samskara is an impression created in our subconscious mind by any action we do. Okay, so we do some uh, physical actions, some verbal actions, things we say, and some mental actions, our thoughts. All these actions are living impressions in our subconscious mind. Such an impression is called a samskara, okay? We use this term a lot when we talk about Vedanta. Now, these samskaras are sitting there in our subconscious mind and they affect our inner world, if you want to call it this way. They affect our experiences, they affect our reaction to experiences, they affect so many things. And if you want to put it this way, all our spiritual sadhana, all the practices we do, is just to deal with our samskaras. Okay, there, there is another term which is called vasanas, 
uh, just to complete the discussion, Vasana is like a tendency which is created by many samskaras. Okay, and if you look at yourself, what you call your personality, your personality, what we call is the sum total of your vasanas, if you want. It is, it is more than that, but I, in, in a simple way, we can say like that, that uh, what, what we are, what, our personality, our uh, uh, person, the way we are, is the collection of our vasanas. Okay, also the way we see reality is a vasana. How do we see reality? We see reality in a dualistic way, right? We see ourselves as a separate entity, different from everything else, even though Vedanta is telling us that this division is imaginary, right? Vedanta is telling us that in the core, in the essence, it is all pure consciousness, which is myself. We have heard about, about, about it, and Krishna was telling it to Arjuna in, already in chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita. We don't see it in this way because we have the vasana of seeing reality in dualistic way. We see ourselves, I see myself as this guy, Mr. Swami Kashi, because of my vasanas, okay? In this sense, all of our sadhana is in order to break those vasanas and to cultivate, to build vasanas corresponding more to reality, if you want to put it in this way, you understand? We want to remove those destructive, harmful, painful vasanas and samskaras, and instead of them plant other vasanas of kindness, of love, of unity, of all the good things that yoga is, is talking about, right? The point is that emotions play a very big role in this, because if I do something with a lot of emotion and a lot of attention, that will create a very powerful samskara. And very powerful samskaras will create a very strong vasana that will replace the old unnecessary vasanas that don't serve me anymore, right? If on the other hand, I do the same actions, but my, my heart is not there. There is no much juice in it. There is no much attention and emotion associated with those actions. The actions may be the same, but it just scratches the surface. It doesn't really replace it. And I think, it is the experience of all of us that we practice, 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 and then, you know, it, it's just the mind is so resisting, right? Arjuna is complaining in chapter six, Chanchalam Himana Krishna Pramati Balavadridam. He says, Krishna, how is it possible? The mind is so strong and so resisting. So what do we need? We need to harness our emotional self, our emotional being, in order to help us on our spiritual path. Our sadhana must be combined with a lot of emotion and attention. Now, not every emotion is very supportive. You see, if I do something with a lot of anger, it is also creating a strong samskara. We know that. Do you remember when you were angry at your friend and you said something very stupid? Yeah, you remember it long after it is already gone. Why? Because it is very powerful. But the emotion of anger, for example, is not very conducive to build up what we call pure vasanas, vasanas of spiritual nature. Emotions like compassion, benevolence, kindness, love, joy, they are much more conducive in this direction, right? So in this sense, when we talk about good emotions and bad emotions, which is very unpopular thing to say today, because there is the notion that all emotions are welcome, it is okay, true, all emotions are welcome, but there are emotions that are conducive for our spiritual 
growth, and there are emotions which are not so conducive. Okay, I'm not talking about suppression of emotions, about uh, um, uh, about uh, uh, ignore, ignore, ignoring emotions. Uh, we are not going into this discussion right now. We don't want to do any of that. If there, there are emotions, we need to experience them. We need to express them. All this is good. But the point is that in our practice, we want to cultivate this line or this direction of emotion, which is supporting our spiritual growth, which is giving us what we need in order to build up, to create very powerful, supportive vasanas or samskaras. And this is where bhakti, devotion, is coming into the picture. You see, what is devotion? What is devotion? In, the, in Bhakti Yoga, they say you take all your emotions and you transform them into divine love. You transform all your being, all your emotions into a divine love. And this is, this is the idea, this is, the, which is one way to present it, but this is the idea behind Bhakti, Bhakti Yoga. It is the juice that is giving taste to our sadhana. Okay, when, when you eat something, if it is completely dry, you cannot feel the taste. That's why we have to add some juice to, to, to make it tasty, to make it uh, 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 palatable. In the same way, bhakti is that emotion which we bring into our sadhana to make it powerful, to make it strong. And therefore, it doesn't, it's not important so much if our devotion is to God, if we believe in God, or if our devotion is to our guru, if we have a guru, or if, if our devotion is to the truth, whatever that be, or if our devotion is to our own self. Whatever that is, in Bhakti Yoga, it doesn't matter so much what is the object of your devotion, but, Ultimately, what is important is that you bring your whole being into what you're doing. And that, of course, is a process. It's something that we have to build up, we have to cultivate, we have to walk. It has nothing to do with religion. You see, there is a lot of confusion between spirituality of, and religion because uh, we see in India, a lot of religious symbolism being used in practices of bhakti yoga. That is fine. These are accessories, these are aids that are helping us to cultivate this devotion, but it is not essential. We will see later on Swami Shivananda is talking about the different types of devotion. We'll see there is devotion which is not directed into, into any object, into anything. It doesn't matter. It is bringing the emotions, bringing your whole being into that one point that is making the difference, that is making every thought, every action very powerful and, and lasting. This is the idea, okay? So we have many examples of great bhaktas, people who were masters of bhakti yoga like Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, uh, Nimkaroli Baba, and, and others great yogis. But also we have to remember that every yogi who, who has realized his or her own self, has realized the truth, is also a bhakta. Sometimes it is not so evident, it is not so external, but it is always there in some form. And I know I have this experience with my own teacher, uh, Swami Chaitanyananda. I, I lived with him and he was, he was a jnani. He was interested in philosophy, Vedanta. He was not doing pujas. He was not, 
you know, there is uh, this prayer of, of the food before eating food is Om Brahma Arpanam, Brahma Avir, and all these that they do in Shivananda. And um, when he will be there, there will be no prayer. I don't know, I, until today, I don't know why, but there will be no, no prayer when he is there. He was completely, uh, no external manifestation of devotion, but you could feel so strongly the devotion in, in him. It, it was something which was not, at least that's my imagination, my, the way I could feel it and see it. There was so much love, so much devotion in there to his own teacher, to other great people, uh, 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 to the self, to the self. When, when he was speaking about certain things, I could recognize the change in his voice and I could see. And there was no much, uh, you know, external, you know, no tears, no laughing, no any, any external expression of, of strong emotions, but you could see it un underlying. And that, that was very beautiful for me uh, uh, to see and, and recognize, okay? And, and I really feel that uh, for me, this was, it is still a big, a big uh, lesson, a big challenge because in my, in my being, in my uh, upbringing, in my nature, I'm more philosophical, I'm more, in, I, I'm not so strong on the emotional side. And, and for me, it is so beautiful, so wonderful that uh, it, it cracked, it crack open. I don't know how to how to say it. When it starts to open up, it is a, it's a little bit shaky sometimes, but it is also it is also very uh, beautiful and very uh, very interesting. Yeah, I I think about about bhakti yoga a lot a lot lately. It is something that I deal with, and and yeah, I was just the other day talking to a friend, and I was saying, you know, sometimes. Uh, when there are so much drama outside going on, your heart opens opens up. And then other times when there is not so much drama, things are more peaceful, you feel that the heart is kind of closed. You don't recognize the openness of, of, the, of the heart in the same way. And, and the question is, first of all, which is better? Is it better to be dramatic and feel your heart torn apart, but really alive and open? Or is it better just to stay like what, what they call shant, Shantabhava? We will see it later on. Like You stay peaceful and then there is something underlying, but the heart, you don't feel that, that openness in the same way. And then also the question, is it possible to combine them, to stay still? and open the heart in the same time, I don't know. I will let you know when, <laughs> when I will have uh, more information on that. Yeah, so this is a little bit, um, a little bit about bhakti. And here in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the discussion is, is very interesting. Uh, it is open with a very common discussion in, um, in yoga, and that has to do with the personal and impersonal manifestations. Like, do you worship God with form or do you worship God without form? Okay, I want first to read the first um, verse and then we will discuss a little bit about it, okay? Now is, the 12th chapter, Bhakti Yogaha, the yoga of devotion. Arjuna Uvacha, Evam Satata Yukta, Ye Tastuam Paryupasate, Ye Chap Yaksharama Vyaktam Tisham Ke Yoga Vittamaha. This is the first verse of chapter 12. By the way, this is the shortest chapter in the Gita, along with chapter 15. They consist of only 12, 20 verses. And Arjuna is asking a question. Okay, we have seen in chapter 11 
at the last verse, Krishna was telling, he who does all actions for me, who looks upon me as the Supreme, who is devoted to me, who is free from attachment, who bears enmity towards no creature, he comes to me for Arjuna. That was the last verse in chapter 11. Now in chapter 12, Arjuna is asking about that. He is asking, Eva, Eva means this way, thus, after you, following what you just said, satata yukta ye. Ye means those, those people who satata yukta ha. Satata means always, and yukta means united. This is a term which is repeating itself in different forms very often in the Bhagavad Gita. And it refers to somebody who is, I don't know what will be the best expression in English, but probably we can say an integrated yoga. Somebody who is all-rounded, who is present, who is developed. Okay, and this is called yukta. Yukta means it is coming from the same root of the, of the word yoga, yuj, which means to unite, to hold together. So satata, always, yukta, those who are always united, which means those who are good yogis, okay? Bhaktaha tvam paryupasate. So bhaktaha, they are bhaktas. What are bhaktas? They are devotees. And they are always tvam. Tvam means you, you, Krishna. Paryupasate. Paryupasate means they worship you. Okay, it is the prefix pari, which means all over. And upasate, they meditate or they, they worship you. Okay, the question is, those devotees who are fully united, they are good practitioners, and they always worship you with devotion. Okay, this is one group. And then Yecha and also those Api, Aksharam, Avyaktam, and those also who are worshiping the Aksharam Avyaktam. Aksharam is indestructible, indestructible and Avyaktam means the unmanifested. Okay, he says the, he, the word Paryupasate refers to both of them. So there are two groups. One group is those who worship you, Krishna. They are ever united. They are real yogis, okay? Then there is another group. They are worshiping the unmanifested, the indestructible, that which is, if you want to say, that which is formless, okay? Tesham, among these two groups, ke yoga vittamaha. Ke means who, who among them is yoga vittamaha. Tamaha is the better knower of yoga. That's, that's the direct translation. Yoga, vit, vit means knower. Yoga vit, the knower of yoga. Yoga vit tamaha is the best knower of yoga among them. This is the question. Now, to say it in simple words, the question is, in a simple way, which is better, to worship God with form or to worship God without form? Is it not a very common question? It is, people ask all the time. And especially people who are coming from an atheist background, who have hard time, difficulty to deal with the concept of God as a manifested being, that is whatever, creating the world and running the world and doing things. Uh, uh, such, sometimes such people have difficult, difficulty with bhakti yoga, with, with the, the whole idea of, of religious manifestation in yoga, and it is very valid question, okay? Now we have to analyze this point a little bit. The first thing I want to discuss 
is that sometimes people who come from the monotheistic religions, namely Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, where God is seen as the one supreme entity, look in an unfavorable or unappreciative way on the Hindu tradition where you have many different manifestations of God, right? You have Krishna and you have Rama and you have Hanuman and you have all these uh, idols and we don't understand anything about it, right? What is it, this whole idea? What is it behind it? And the thing I want to put forth, the, the thing I want to argue is that our mind, by its very nature, demands something to hold on to. No matter what idea you have about reality, about creation, about the manifestation of the world, the mind needs something to hold on to. And Krishna is going to talk about it later on in this chapter. We will see. It is, it is very difficult, almost impossible for us to give up the hold to a certain idea about God, about creation, about reality. We need something. The problem is that the reality cannot be held by the mind. If we understand reality in some way, even a little bit, and we understand the limitations of the mind, we will immediately be able to see that no matter what concept you have in your mind about reality, it is nothing but a concept. You cannot hold reality with the mind because the mind is included in reality. It cannot encompass reality. You understand this point? You cannot, the mind being included in reality cannot encompass reality. And therefore, no matter what idea you have, it will always remain just as an idea. The problem starts when people think that their idea is somehow encompassing reality, holding the truth. And then if I am holding the truth, then you are holding something else, right? Because your other idea must be wrong. Must be, how can both of us hold reality? And then spiritual people, so to say, they always want to be nice to everybody. So they say, yeah, I'm holding part of reality and you are holding part of reality and it is fine. It's actually not even that. You know, there is the famous uh, uh, analogy of the elephant, right? The five blind people come to analyze an elephant. Okay, they go to the zoo to see an elephant. One of them is holding his tail. One of them is holding his ear. One of them is touching his leg and the other one is belly, right? And then they come back and they start to discuss what is an elephant. And one say, well, elephant is like a, is like a, a, bra, a, a broom, you know, a little flexible broom. He was holding the tail. One of them said, what broom? It's like a, a, a big paper. He was holding the ear. The other say, well, no, it's like a pillar and like this. And none of them have seen the elephant. But the thing is, none of them really knows what, what elephant is, right? Because elephant is, it's not like each one of them knows something of the elephant. No, none of them really understand elephant. This is, this is like we are, we, we, the mind cannot understand reality, cannot hold reality. Every concept is only a concept. And it is, it is very good if we are able to appreciate it. Because then we don't need to conceptualize the truth. We don't need it. We use conceptualization because it is necessary. Because it is necessary. Why it is necessary? Because this is the very nature of the mind. The mind refuses to keep things 
without holding to something. You know, if we talk about infinity, right? If we talk about infinity, you think inf infinity means there is no any boundaries. But if you really very carefully analyze your mind, when you say in your mind infinity, you imagine something like the sky. You imagine something like the ocean. You have some image in your mind, which in itself is not infinite. Even the sky is not, is not really infinite. You think about something which is very, 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 very long, and you think it is infinite. No, it is still finite because the mind cannot hold something which has no boundaries. The mind cannot hold infinity. So we substitute it for something that represents for us infinity. In the same way, when we talk about the truth, when we talk about God, when we talk about consciousness, there is nothing to hold there for the mind. But the very nature of the mind is holding to things. And therefore, in the Hindu tradition, understanding this, they said, okay, I need to give the mind something to hold to in order to transcend the mind. Because ultimately, realization is about transcending the mind and not holding reality with the mind, right? I need to transcend the mind. How do I do it? I create something for the mind to chew on. I create a toy for the mind to hold to. So the mind is not in the way, and that will help me to jump over and go beyond the mind, if you want. You see? Understanding that every idea is just an idea. In Sanskrit, this principle is, is uh, in Vedanta, we say, adhyaropa apavadhyam nishprapancha prapanchyate. When you want, uh, Nishprapancha means that which is incomprehensible, something that cannot be grasped, that you cannot hold to. Nishprapancha prapanchyate, that which is incomprehensible become comprehensible, be, become grasped by a process of adhyaropa and apavada. Adhyaropa means superimposition. You create something, Technically, if you want, artificially, you create something which is limited, but the mind can hold to. And then you slowly start to remove the different limitations, the different aspects that are limiting it. And once you remove all the limitations, what is left behind is the nishprapancha, is that which is beyond. This is how it works in philosophy. And therefore, when you worship Krishna, it doesn't mean that you think that Krishna is a blue guy who lived 5,300 years ago. It doesn't mean that this is your idea of God. It means that it is something, if you want, artificial that is being used in order to transcend the mind and land in that which is beyond all concepts. And therefore, my limitations, my conception is not better than yours. You see, now we are not talking about uh, uh, who is right. It is the, the leg of the elephant, the, the tail of the elephant, or the ear of the... It is not any more discussion about that. It is the idea that according to my nature, according to my personal understanding and nature, I correspond to a particular idea, knowing that it is just an idea, knowing that it cannot encompass just that which is beyond all idea in order to ultimately transcend it. Okay, and therefore, in my understanding, this concept is superior in a way to that idea that there is only one God and it is my God. 
It is my God and he is the right one. And unfortunately, because you were not born, I was born Jewish and therefore the Jewish God is the right one. And unfortunately you were not born Jewish. So you are worshiping the wrong God, you know? And if you ask in a monotheistic person, so how this God looks like? You say, oh no, God has no form, right? God has no form. They would say, no, there's no form to that. The idea that God has form is false. But first of all, if God represents the totality, the totality includes the form and the formless. If you say God is without form, then you are limiting the totality. That's one argument. But more than that, more than that, if you ask such a person, is God strong or weak? What do you think they will say? So God is all strength, all the most strong. Is God kind or cruel? No, God is not cruel. He's very, very kind. Is God wise or stupid? No, he's all knowing. He's the most wise guy everywhere. What is it if not a form? Form doesn't mean only that the five elements are manifest. Form means any concept, any idea. When you form an idea about God being like this and not like that, you have created a form. And when you are not acknowledging it, when you are not recognizing that you have just created, you know, Swami Vivekananda says, he says, when a buffalo thinks about God, he thinks about a big buffalo. In the same way, when we think about God, we, we, we have two hands, then we make God with four hands. That's how my teacher used to say. We, 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 we are a little weak, so God must be very strong. We are sometimes kind, sometimes unkind, so God must be very, very kind. We just create an idealization of a person because that's all we know. You know, we, and therefore Swami Vivekananda says it is not that God created man in his own image. It is that man created God in his own image. You see how, how evolved these people and then they finish writing this and they go for a puja. Why? Why? Because, because they understand, they understand, they are not caught up with the manifestation, they are not caught up with the form. For us, it is so difficult to, to give up this holding. No, these, these uh, pujas, they are so strange. What is this pouring milk on idols made of uh, uh, brass and, and doing all this crazy stuff and the mantras and all, it, it, it looks so silly. Well, it is silly for you, then don't do it. If for somebody it's not silly, it is, it is meaningful. Why? Because it can bring bhakti. Remember how we opened the discussion in this class? Bhakti is this emotion that we harness for creating powerful samskaras. How? Different practices. So for somebody, it will be a puja. For somebody else, it will be chanting. Um, um, mantras or whatever, and for somebody else, it will be sitting and studying the Bhagavad Gita, right? Do you think that we are sitting here and study in order to know something that we didn't know yesterday? This is not the purpose of what we are doing here, in my understanding. If for me, at least, we are now sitting here and discussing in order to bring this quality, this rasam, this juice. This is how I know how to do it for myself. You know, when I talk to you, when I see you listening, when I'm, when th this is how I feel that it is, it is open, opening something in me. This is, this is bhakti, you know. I don't know. Uh, for me, going to pujas, it doesn't, it doesn't do it. I don't, I, I, when I go, sometimes I have to go, I go, I, I just want to run away. Now, does it mean that pujas are not good? It's not. It's not because for somebody else, that's, that's so heart opening. It is so wonderful, you know? Okay. 
Yeah, I get emotional, you see? Bhakti. <laughs> yeah. Arjuna, uh, Arjuna said, so this is Arjuna's question. Following the last verse of chapter 11, Arjuna is asking Krishna about this idea of manifestation or non-manifestation. How, how is it better to worship you? Because Krishna, you told us that he who does all actions for me, who looks upon me as the supreme, who is devoted to me, and etc., such a people, such a person will come to me. Right? That's what he was saying. And now Arjuna is asking, wait a minute. What about all these people who wash in the impersonal, the unmanifested? They are no good. Which, which, which of them is better? Okay. Swami Shivananda says, the 12th discourse goes to prove that bhakti yoga or the yoga of devotion is much easier than jnana yoga or the yoga of knowledge. Okay. He says, Jnana yoga is good, bhakti yoga is also good, but bhakti yoga is easier. You know, uh, Ramakrishna Paramahansa, he had a, an image. He said, there are two types of yogis. One is like the kitty and one is like the baby monkey. You know what is the difference between a kitty and a baby monkey? When the kitty is uh, uh, in trouble, it is just crying, 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 and the mother, the cat, is coming and lifting it and take it, taking it to another place, right? It doesn't do anything, it just cry, and it taking it to another place. But if you ever saw the, the monkey babies, the mother doesn't leave them, doesn't help them anything. They are, they are holding the mother. They are catching the mother usually on, on her belly and holding the mother and she is just going along. She's not holding them at all. They have to hold by their own effort. So he used to say that Gyanis, they are like the baby monkeys. They are holding tenaciously to truth, but, but it is dangerous because if you fall, you know, sometimes they fall, these baby monkeys also, and, and jumping from tree to tree, if the baby monkey falls, it can die. On the other hand, a bhakta is like a kitty. It's like just crying, 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 and God come and take you, and you don't need to do anything. So this is the image uh, that Ramakrishna Paramahansa used to, to use. And yeah, I always used to say, because for a long time I was feeling like, like uh, my path is the path of Yana and I'm not so much into, into devotion and all this. So uh, when, when people would say this, I would say, but imagine that a baby monkey will sit and cry, cry, cry. Nobody will come and lift. If you are a baby monkey, you better hold on to your mom. You know, that's that's who you are, right? So find out who you are and just do that. Anyway, so Swami Shivananda says, uh, in Bhakti Yoga, the devotee establishes a near and dear relationship with, with the Lord. He cultivates slowly any one of the five bhavas or attitudes according to his temperament, taste, and capacity. Okay, I mentioned it very briefly, that there are different bhavas, different attitudes, or different forms of devotion in the bhakti way. The five attitudes are the shanta bhava, the attitude of a, a peaceful adoration. Shanta bhava uh, means that externally you don't see any, anything. This is, I think, what I told you about my teacher. It was, it was like that. Externally, you don't see, there is no much uh, emotion displayed, but inside it is, it is very powerful. It is a constant dedication, constant presence. And this is called Shanta Bhava. Okay, Bhishma was famous for that. Uh, then Dasya Bhava. 
Dasya Bhava means the attitude of a servant towards the master. Okay. Uh, you know, Krishna Das, the word Das means a servant. Uh, uh, a servant of Krishna is Krishna Das. So there is the idea in Bhakti that you are like the servant and, and God is like the master. Okay, this is one uh, attitude. Then there is Sakya Bhava. Sakya Bhava means friendship. The attitude of God is like your friend. Like Boston friend, you talk to God, you you just like a friend, and, and it is very, very beautiful, it is very sweet, right? Then there is Vatsalya Bhava. Vatsalya Bhava is like when you see God as your own child. The example usually given is a Yashoda, the mother of Krishna, the stepmother of Krishna. For her, God was her own child. Okay, and and uh Anybody or any devotee can, can cultivate this kind of bhava, that, this type of devotion towards God if they, if they want. Then the last one is madhurya bhava, is like the bhava of God as the beloved, as your, as your beloved, as the partner. And the example is, is uh, the gopis, or particularly radha. For her, Krishna was her lover, okay? And, and she knew it is God, but this was the sweetness, the form of uh, a connection to God. The devotee adopts this attitude towards the Lord. The last, Madhurya Bhava, is the culmination of devotion. Among all these, the highest one is Madhurya Bhava, seeing God as your partner as your beloved. It is merging or absorption in the Lord. The devotee adores the Lord. He constantly remembers him. Okay, here Swami Shivananda enters into another topic, which is the nine modes of bhakti. I think we will keep it for uh, next week because we should discuss a little more about it. But I would only say that ultimately it all culminates to constant presence. Whatever is the object of your devotion, to the extent you can hold this during the day, during the night, during all times in your mind, to that extent, your bhakti or devotion manifest, right? It is all about constant remembrance, okay? And we will talk more about it in the next week. And again, I will just mention for those who are not in the opening of the class, next week again, we will meet on Tuesday, okay? Um, uh, tomorrow, I, I'm now in Berlin. Tomorrow I fly to New York. And Monday, I fly to Toronto. Okay, so next week, on Tuesday, I will talk to you from Toronto. Okay. And uh, love you very much. We will conclude now. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Maam Britam Gamaya Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachete Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Shri Sadguru Maharaj Ki Jai Hari Om Hari Om Tat Sat